Welcome to another episode of the Fertility Conversations. Today, we are joined by a lovely guest, Dr. Elizabeth Amoa. She's the author of The Unspoken Identity, a book that can be found in over 500 libraries around the world. She founded the foundation Special Lady Awareness in 2017 in a bid to raise awareness on reproductive health disorders and to encourage women to seek early medical intervention in order to prevent unnecessary surgeries and complications. Dr. Elizabeth was born with two wombs, two cervixes, and two vaginal canals, and wrote her book to narrate her journey of discovering her rare congenital abnormality and the medical complications she experienced. She joins us today to share her journey and to tell us about her book, and a special foundation. So welcome Dr. Elizabeth and thank you so much for joining us today. Good morning, thank you for having me today. And uh, wow, <laughs> such a, <laughs> an, an amazing introduction. Yes, my name is Elizabeth, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Amor. I'm still not using the doctor, <laughs> yes, I have to continue using it. <laughs> and yes, I am the founder of Special Lady Awareness and also the author of The Unspoken Identity, as you said. And I call myself the Special Lady just because of obviously the real congenital abnormality that I have and also a woman that believes that um, our medical condition do not define us in our journey. Uh, there is a purpose for us to have certain journey or certain experiences. So this is Absolutely. a little introduction that I can give. Yay. Thank you so much for being here today. And I'll have your book. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> well done. So to start off, we just wanted to ask you, tell us a little bit about yourself, what you do for fun. <laughs> <laughs> so um mostly what I do is I do a lot of research. So for me, people think <laughs> fun, my fun is a lot of research, reading online or searching articles, the reason be because of my journey. And I want to still understand why I, I'm born different, you know, what what actually happened, what went wrong, because um, there is not a lot of uh, health or I say medical research out there. So most of my time is reading online, researching on science websites, health websites, you know, Googling things and trying to understand who I am, trying to not understand only the malformation of my womb, but also endometriosis, because obviously I have endometriosis stage four, which is about endometriosis. I have uterine fibroids, I have adhesions, and also secondary infertility. So for me, a lot of the research are always around these kind of conditions and how I can manage the symptoms, because right. after all the surgeries that I've had, I haven't had any cure, and the symptoms used to be worse compared to now. So for me, a lot of my research and my hobby is doing those things and ensuring that I get the right management and how to live with these conditions. Aside that, um, I'm a mother. I have a daughter by God grace, who is a teenager. She just did a teenager. Mm. So handful. <laughs> and, and <laughs> I love to um, mentor and coach young people. So mostly youth and also some young adults. And what else can I say? And also, I'm so passionate about my advocacy work, especially the awareness. You know, that's my second baby. That's <laughs> <Start> my daughter. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, so I'm married yeah, to a military man. And what else can I say? Ooh, thank him and for his service. <laughs> yes, he's in service. We, <laughs> he loves service. And obviously, um, what else can I say about me? Um uh, I think just ask questions because if I start to talk, I don't think we're going to open it. <laughs> we're going to be here all day. <laughs> but that's good. You know, I love the fact that you're so passionate about what you do and raising awareness. We need um, more education, really, because oftentimes people don't even know about this. Sometimes people are experiencing something similar and they're living in silence because they don't think anyone else is dealing with the same thing. They think they're mm -hmm. alone. So uh, all your advocacy work in creating awareness and educating people is definitely really helpful and so welcomed. So thank you for all that you do. You. Um, I mean, you mentioned a whole lot of things that uh, impact fertility uh, that you've highlighted. So I wonder if you want to share perhaps your own journey to motherhood and perhaps if there was any impact mm -hmm. on either of your conditions that uh, on your fertility journey? 
So for me, I remember in 2008, I was diagnosed with primary infertility. So I was told conceiving was going to be very difficult. Perhaps I would have never have a child, that's what they said, because they diagnosed me with um, multiple fibroids. Nice. And uh, it wasn't one, I think it was about six or eight, if I remember that. Oh, wow. At the moment, it was eight. By that time, it was six or eight. can't remember exact numbers. And um, it wasn't something that I was quite concerned. I was still young. I was at university. So, and I was studying law. So I thought, oh, this is just a list in my mind. I'm not interested in having babies yet. But then again, I stopped using contraception. I I then also tried to cut down certain lifestyle, like stop drinking and started, stop eating red meat at that time, cut down my sugar, stop eating sugar. So although I wasn't ready for the baby, but I was trying to kind of be healthy so that the fibers wouldn't grow because these mm-hmm. things actually help the fibers to kind of shrink or kind of just stay steady, don't grow. And just after 18 months or so, I got pregnant. And certainly, and I remember it was quite a shock because that time no one knew I had two wombs. Um, when I got pregnant, they, they didn't believe it was pregnancy. Obviously, uh, most of the scan was not showing the baby. They thought it was a type of pregnancy, pushing me to have abortions. But I heard on my faith, so my pregnancy was quite unusual. I was bleeding throughout my pregnancy. Obviously, it came to why you know I yeah. had that kind of unusual condition, but I had about 15, 20 scans during my pregnancy though, and still nothing was diagnosed. And um, when I say nothing, apart from the fibroids. So my motherhood was not the greatest fun, although it was a shock, but there was a lot of um, psychological effects. The fact of seeing blood every month, I'll be, I'll rush to the hospital and they were still couldn't tell me what was wrong. At that time I was studying my master's and it was masters, you know, of laws, so LLM. So some way, somehow, my focus was more my education, as always. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I wasn't very concerned with the pregnancy. I just thought, you know what, just whatever will happen will happen. But I wasn't going to have an abortion. I heard on my feet. She was born premature, seven months. And it wasn't an easy journey. After I was, I could not conceive again. So it was that was part of the reason why that I started pers- to persist to get answers to why I wasn't having any more child. And I was exhibiting a lot of symptoms like heavy bleeding, irregular menstrual periods, and in, um and also um quite feeling fainting, tired. Initially, they were ruling me down to postnatal depression. She turned four years, and the same symptoms got worse and worse. And that was when. I then started to seek more more answers and they discovered that I have obviously an unusual condition called the uterine diaphysis, which is having two womb tool services, two vagina canals, also stage four endometriosis and adhesion. So that also put me through to, I would say, a more serious secondary infertility. Although I was still able to get pregnant again, second time, unfortunately, I experienced something called silence miscarriage or mixed miscarriage or mixed abortion so the fetus died when it was only two months and I carried it for another two months which oh, I wow. didn't know so since then sorry. it's okay since then I haven't conceived um the last time I checked they said I can't conceive without help but it's not happening <laughs> and oh. I haven't tried really deeper I mean I I don't use protection obviously with my husband but then again, um, it can happen, yes, because I've been able to conceive twice. But for me, the chances of me carrying it to full term is also another issue because of all the complications I have. So for me, conceiving, sometimes I'm just not interested because I'm scared that if I get pregnant, what if I have a silent miscarriage or I have a stillbirth, which obviously having you to the deficit, you are high risk of miscarriages, stillbirth and, and premature delivery. So the question is, do I want to put my body back to where I was when I had a premature child? It wasn't easy. She had been an incubator while I was going through health-wise. So all those are part of the, the reason why sometimes I feel like it's still a blessing that God hasn't given me another chance to conceive. So that's my journey of infertility. I know it doesn't sound very glamorous, but unfortunately it is what it is. Yeah. Wow. That's so much to have to have had to deal with all of that. And even the fact that they didn't even think you're pregnant. 
Mm -hmm. and going back and forth and doing several scans and still being told it must have been so much. And when did they finally realize that you were actually pregnant? I think I was about three and a half to four months. Wow. That's when they saw the baby because the blood test was, so this, the scan wasn't showing the baby. The urinary test was showing I was pregnant and blood test was saying I was pregnant. But when they scanned, they couldn't locate the baby. So they were thinking it was a topic pregnancy. But right. today we're standing here, it was because they were scanning the wrong womb. My daughter was in my right womb wow. and I'm sure they were scanning the left womb. So about three and a half, four months, that time, obviously the baby, the pregnancy was grown. So they were able to locate the, the right womb. So they were then scanning the right room, womb, which is me. That must have been so scary though, because you think about, what if you had gone ahead and taken the the pills or any whatever they wanted to do for the to treat the because it was eleven pregnancy of a known location, right? That's what they were thinking. And yeah. you know, if you had gone ahead and had that medical intervention, and to think, wow, today so I would have looked that with regrets. Yeah, 100%. I always say that, and I remember I try to ask questions. When my daughter was born at one point, I said, why did you guys were pushing me to have an abortion? But she was there and no one was able to answer me. But then looking at my, you know, my formation, it's not because um, they knew it and they wanted me to terminate the baby. It's a condition that can be hidden. Some people are blessed to have a very experienced uh, radiologist that can diagnose them early. But mm. there are some that come with it. Because if in my case, um, the MRI only showed two wounds. It was through keyhole surgery and also uh -huh. the one that they go through the vagina. I forgot the name. That's when they diagnosed me with two services and two vagina canals and even the endometriosis. That doesn't make sense. So, so like a hysteroscopy or something. Yeah, that's it. That's that's when they diagnosed me with the two services, two vagina canals, and also the stage four endometriosis. So my case is still quite complicated. I don't know why. Maybe because I have the complete malformation and because also I have uh, very severe endometriosis with adhesions. And to me, it's because they left me for a very long time. Then neglect went on for many years because I started exhibiting these symptoms way back in Africa when I was six years old. Went to France at the age oh, wow. of 12, 13 years old. And obviously the unspoken identities to talk about, you know, my, my journey. And when you read a book, obviously you've read it, you'll be like, hang on. Why didn't the doctors take precaution? Why didn't they do the right thing? And mm. this is why I wrote the book, because I wrote it not only because of my experience, it's also to, you know, shed light on, on some things and some kind of um, signs that doctors keep ignoring, because right. it was there. I asked questions. I pleaded. My concern was raised many, many times. No one was listening to me. They thought I was making it up. They thought I was crazy, you know, trying to give me antidepressant and trying to say you are not, you know, okay in the head. Yes, it's true with, you know, having a premature baby and all that. But it was not just postnatal depression. It was more to it. And today we go back and realize that there was something wrong. And yeah. why didn't you find what was wrong with it? Well done and advocating for yourself and pushing for more investigations because that's that was what made the difference, right? For them to eventually diagnose your condition and even the endometriosis and uh, and to see what was actually happening. Because oftentimes, if you get that kind of pushback from the doctors, you can start to question and doubt yourself that perhaps mm -hmm. they're right. Mm -hmm. Maybe mm -hmm. there is something, you know, wrong with me, or perhaps maybe there's really nothing there. I should just you know stop going there and pushing so well done on pushing and now mm -hmm. for advocating for others to advocate for themselves and raising awareness and for writing a book as well it's so important that people see others that have experienced something similar or mm -hmm. that other people that have pushed and advocated for themselves because it gives you the the strength to be able mm -hmm. to say okay mm -hmm. all right perhaps i can ask more questions perhaps i can mm -hmm. ask for more investigations mm -hmm. to be done mm -hmm. so thank you for all of that um and now when they did find out that you had two uteruses two cervix two vaginal canals how was that finding that out 
I mean, it was a shock to me when it was find out. And it wasn't a straightforward, like, um, have an MRI. As I said, it wasn't just that. I had an MRI. Yeah. It still wasn't enough. I had to have a keyhole surgery. The first keyhole surgery was unsuccessful, although they did cut me. So I had to wait for another month, go back again in the theater room for a second one. And they has to um, be done by a specialist because of the complications. And um, it was a shock. Uh, but at the same time, it was also answers to what has been happening since childhood. So it right. was like, oh, I wasn't making it up. You know, this is real. Like, hey, mm -hmm. I wasn't lying. I wasn't crazy. And this is there. It was like, OK, this is this is strange. This is just not the usual thing I've ever heard. But then I was given the leaflets and uh, I was told I can research about it. And I, 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 everything just sum up that it was, it was the right thing. They were saying the right thing. It was in Germany anyway, and I had the opportunity to have these um, treatments and diagnosis through the British Army, which I'm so grateful for them. You know, it's the reason why I'm so <laughs> proud that my husband is still serving. So um, yeah, it was a very um, exciting and also unusual and. Um, a kind of a new beginning for me. It was like a rebirth. It was right. a moment I realized that all these years, you know, at my 32 or 33 years, I, I wasn't born now, I am born. I'm born again, you know. Yeah. And um, I wasn't ready to come out publicly, obviously. I just wanted to still deal with it. I I obviously told my family first and um, because they were so worried from childhood, sometimes they thought I was sickle, sickle cells, they thought I had all sorts of condition because I've always been ill since childhood. So it kind of then made them pressure that, oh, she has she doesn't have sickle cells because I've done so many tests for sickle cells and all sorts and nothing was coming up. So they were like, oh, okay, you don't have sickle cells. You don't have this, you don't have that. You don't have cancer, you don't have that. So this is- What is it like? Yeah. Yeah. And I thought, yeah. And um, I was also then in the process of Get, going to get help to have a second baby so mild fertility treatment so that was my focus which was successful but unfortunately that's when I said I experienced a silent miscarriage so that uh, mild fertility treatment did not also help and um, after I was I decided to come out because the journey I thought I have had enough and I also thought I was given a second chance to be alive because I carried the dead fetus for two months I could have died, you know. Yeah, the infection. You could have had an infection that could have spread. Yeah. So I then realized that, you know what, well, come out, tell your story, don't hide anymore. You don't know what tomorrow holds. And obviously having all these kind of complications, especially with the offices, you know, I kind of have kidney diseases. I'm kind of high risk to kidney diseases and so all sorts. So I thought, let me come out and tell my story. And today we hear I have other conditions. I recently got diagnosed with diabetes on top. So it's like it doesn't end, you know, having all these complications. My immune system is very compromised. So if for me, if I didn't come out, who knows, I would have been gone. And coming out has helped me strong. It has given me hope. You know, the fact that you wake up and you know millions of women, not just thousands, because my story is in over 150 or probably more countries. My book in over 500 libraries in the world. You know, thinking about all these, that give me the hope and faith and strong, like the strength to carry on. And, you know, I'm so grateful for everyone that has, you know, encouraged me, supported me, including yourself, giving me the platform to talk about you know, my journey and inspire others. That is, is awesome. It's, you know, I don't know how to explain. <laughs> thank you so much. I mean, thank you for choosing to share. I mean, it, that's amazing because you know that this is such a taboo. I mean, fertility, anything that has to do with fertility is taboo subject, but having unique um, female, uh, you know, part of your reproductive system being unique right and so mm -hmm. telling anybody i think across the globe they'll probably you know ask again like seriously what did he say but especially in Africa. different african countries like to say that to come out and publicly say that you have two vagina canals you have two services to uterus says and that must have been taken a lot because i mean i mean didn't your family say uh maybe not let's keep this on the down low <laughs> 
let's not like we're glad it's all sorted now but there's no need especially when the backlash the negativity start they were like no 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 stop talking please it's it's (laughs) it's not right what we're reading online people are bashing you the insults are too much and i'm like you know i'm stubborn i'm a leo (laughs) (laughs) and that's it there's always a lot of pushback for speaking now for what's right i don't understand i think maybe perhaps because we're just used to having things a certain way it's the culture yeah it's the culture and it's like um i think is i was telling someone yesterday about it it's more like there was no safe environment people don't feel safe there are people that really want to come out in africa and talk about the unspoken things that we don't talk about but the thing is the, the awareness is not there. The yeah. safe environment is not there. They feel they will be judged. They feel people will laugh, you know, and, and they, people will laugh at you. People will judge you. People will talk. But you just look at the bright side, the amount of people and lives you touch. And that's yeah. what matters. And for me, that's what I, I focus on. The fact that I'm encouraging others to speak up, you know, get early diagnosis. The fact that people can, can help themselves save their life not undergoing unnecessary surgeries because i have had six surgeries there are some women have had 10 7 8 some people they're not lucky they go one or two they die out of it you know some people they never recover the complications and um, some of us we've been fortunate that we use a lot of you know herbal remedies in terms of let's say drinking green tea ginger tea and all sorts you know to to maintain them the, the the scars, you know, the, you know, the sores when you have all these surgeries and, you know, it still hasn't been easy. There has been sometimes I, I switch from, <laughs> you know, um, uh, supplements to supplements. I try CBD oil, I try CBD tea and they're very expensive. I don't eat red meat. I, I have to eat certain kind of food. Sometimes you feel like you, you know, you've got nose, yeah, all these kind of things and you still have to find ways adding ginger to all your food you eat eating a lot of greens eating this drinking this not drinking it's too much but yes. if we don't talk if we don't build that kind of safe environment how can someone also learn from it and also manage their symptoms or any other complications they're going through or even their own personal life family goals especially after covid we've all seen a lot of people are still suffering mentally, you know, yeah. because of what we went through. This is why that taboo thing and stereotype and labeling, it's about time we need to stop. Yeah, definitely. So well said. Thank you. Thank you for choosing to speak out in spite of the um, pressure to not speak out. Thank you. So in writing your book now, you choosing to write that, of course, I know, like you said, you wanted to advocate, you wanted to raise awareness. Was that why you went ahead and wrote the book then? So the spoken identity one was always to tell my story, to mm-hmm. let people know. Because for me, all the opportunities I've had, the interviews, which we all know I've had, I've done hundreds of them. I felt like the platform wasn't enough to me. I felt like mm. people still do not understand me or they don't get why I came out to tell my story because I felt like a lot of people were focusing on she's got two vaginas but then they don't understand what uterus deficit is they don't understand the complications they don't understand what it entails yes don't get me wrong the pleasure part of it oh yeah she got oh she got two holes (laughs) you know that one is is there you know people can fantasize whatever they want to fantasize yeah it's not a joke it's complicated exactly it's a, I mean, living with it, it's not a joke because you become high risk to other reproductive uh, yeah. disorders mm-hmm. and also you become more high risk to infertility. So all this was that, okay, put them in a the book, put a journey, let people know that this is what you went through and also let people know that, yes, leave a legacy. You were the first black woman to come out globally, you know, to tell your story. Well and, done. You know, being an African, being Ghanaian, being an Ashanti, obviously, if so, <laughs> why I've got the boldness in me. You know, from the so I thought, okay, let me leave that legacy. 
let me make my motherland, which Ghana we call proud. Let me make my roots, my heritage proud. Let people know that, yes, you were an African Ghanaian woman that came out first, first ever to talk about the unspoken. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so that's why I put them in the book. And I'm so grateful thinking that today Oxford University have access to the book, Cambridge University have access to the book, um, Pasico Archives, British Library, which America, all of I don't even know all of them, so many libraries in the world, including library, uh Ghana Library Authorities, America is in Canada. In Canada, yes, Australia, um, that one, Germany, Italy, name them, you know, a lot of universities, a lot of libraries across the globe, in Japan, almost Amazing. everywhere. As soon as you Google <laughs> the unspoken identity, the woman with two vaginas, or just the unspoken identity that will come up. And for me, this is what I wanted to leave. I wanted people to hear the story. I wanted people to learn. And I also wanted the scientists, which is now that's my, my move now. I want them to do more research on it. This is why I'm pleading with yeah. scientists out there, medical professionals, that I'm pleading for them to do more research on this condition. Because yeah. I feel like there was not enough research. People just don't understand. I've met a lot, countless of medical professionals, doctors that they've never heard about my condition. They don't even know. So imagine I'll go and sit in the local, um, which is uh, GB, you know, local surgery. And then you ask the person, oh, I've got to the deficit. What is that? What does it entail? They don't. And it's not your fault. And you're thinking, as a health professional, exactly. you are in a GP, you know, GP is a general thing, at least have a little bit of an idea that yeah. there are women that have different womb. So when I come to you today and said, oh, I've got urinary infection, and next week I come back, I've got urinary infection, then it's, you should understand that, oh, someone with this kind of condition tends to have a lot of urinary infection. Therefore, the third form of urinary infection, let me send that person off to do kidney test because right. if I'm not careful, she might get kidney diseases. Because yeah. the doctors do not know, they will just be giving antibiotics for how long? So these are the reasons why I feel like a lot of research needs to be done so that they will know people like me tend to have a lot of infections. They tend to have a lot of um, uh, other conditions that it can yeah. be complicated. I have diabetes. And I remember when I got diagnosed, I asked the doctor, why did I get diabetes? And he was like, oh, diabetes is, you know, I'm on Africa. I said, no, no, my family, no one have diabetes. <laughs> so it's not in my family. Why did I have diabetes? Oh, your immune system. I said, what, what caused it? Okay, hang on. I have endometriosis, stage four, bowel endometriosis. I have it with the My immune system is very compromised. Is it because of that? Oh, I don't know. I don't, I don't, you know, I'm like, you see, that alone, but for me, it's because of that. My immune system is so compromised. Maybe I'm not, you know, my system is not working properly because I've had a lot of symptoms. Sometimes I do have. I've got chronic pain and all of a sudden I started having acute pain as well, back pain, waist pain. Sometimes it goes and it come back, it come very severe. So all the time there was something wrong somewhere. But I wish I would have a medical professional to tell me that this is the reason. So all this is what kind of motivated me to write my first book, which my second book too is coming. Which is the <laughs> that's great we need that information people need that education to be aware because again very important because some if you read your book now and then some you know somewhere along the line you come across someone that says they have two uterus or two, two cervix you understand that yes that is possible mm -hmm. i've read a book you know about someone that did this that had the same or you know you have a niece or nephew uh, sorry niece or daughter or whoever mm -hmm. the case you come across you'll be able to be aware and to be able to provide support and, you know, direct them to the proper place to seek more help. So that's really important. Uh, how can people get the book? I mean, I got mine on Amazon. Yay. <laughs> uh, where can people get it apart from Amazon? Are there other places perhaps oh, in Ghana? Oh, everywhere. Yeah. eBay, Benz and Nobles, Blackwell, right. uh, where else? Aston Macaulay, um, in the UK, WH Smith, in America, Walmart. Targets, it's so amazing. Amazing. everywhere. 
You're everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> if you if you don't have access to Amazon on any of the other places that uh, she's highlighted, yeah, please just Google. It will come wherever up. Country you are, as I said, in Japan, you can buy. In India, you can buy. In Saudi, so a lot of bookshops, uh, private right. bookshops, all them as well. They were also Amazing. in local libraries. You can always access them online and read them online. Sign up so you can also read online, but try and buy it. It's better so that you can yes, also so you have your copy. You know, the more you buy when you the more you buy, the more you know you support our NGO in some way, somehow. Yes, so. yes, yes. And then your NGO, special lady uh awareness. Why did that why why was what's the inspiration? behind studying that in Ghana? So the inspiration was to come out and tell my story and also use the platform to educate. So it was more to educate people and raise awareness on reproductive health. I would say promote reproductive health rights among women and young girls and also combat menstrual poverty because obviously mm. menstrual, you know, menstrual poverty is one of the things that affect a lot of Africans. And it's all kind of linked to yeah. reproductive health, I would say education. So um, it was founded in 2017. It all started with just an Instagram post thinking, oh, let me come out there, let me just tell my story. And then as I know, you know, it's gone so far and, you know, it got registered and it's now um, seen as an NGO and also recognized by Ghana Social Welfare. So um, it's kind of a huge uh, project now. Every year we try to um, impact over 3,000 to 5,000 lives. At the moment, we've impacted over 25,000 young girls. Amazing. Um, if we add well done. Things, <laughs> thank you. Out of our 30 uh, educational establishments, which is universities and secondary schools. So, and um, um, yeah, it's a lot. We literally just came... Back, I mean, I came back by the team as with the volunteers are in Ghana on the team, came back from Ghana where we also visited Volta region and also Ashanti region. And mm -hmm. we do community outreach. So we do workshops, seminars and conferences to raise awareness on this reproductive health. And obviously also do donations of sanitary products. So we just don't go and right. talk, we give parts, sanitary products. And we also give medical equipment. So we've so far we've donated to five um healthcare units in Ghana, over wow. hundred and thirty thousand dollars worth of medical equipment. Amazing. And yeah, on top of my mind, because yeah, <laughs> so quite a lot of <laughs> donations. <laughs> <in here. laughs> and yeah, so, so the sanitary products, uh, all the twenty five thousand girls, we they they received sanitary parts. So yeah, each so I'll say about that numbers, and including the women having adults, the women in the communities, which we try this time in in the Volta region, we donated to four hundred women. So yeah, so each time we also take some women and also donate aside the students. So um, we pray to God that we will be able to cover the whole Ghana region. We've done Eastern region, we've done uh, Central, we've done Ashanti, we've done Volta. Region, so we still have quite a few. We've got sixteen regions, so quite a few to go. Well, yeah. a lot of funding is needed, and we want to cross over not just Ghana. We want to go to Nigeria, South Africa, because all of all those countries you can get my book, you can get my story. Malawi, they've all published my story. Kenya, especially, they've published my story on TV and radio. So all those countries, I think it's about time I start to think of going there. And, also impacting the lives, not just they reading my book or reading my story online, because I'm sure some of them think I'm not real. <laughs> Although they're not <laughs> I know. <laughs> a lot on, on Facebook and all the media platforms, you see them sending message requests. Oh, are you real? I want to meet you. So I think it would be good to try and cross, you know, the border of Ghana. Well done. What a legacy. Thank You're you living and actually building while you're here um that is so many twenty five thousand people lives in ghana that's you know all with families so all those twenty five thousand you've impacted them you've impacted their families you've impacted other people that are coming um connected within the community so that's really amazing that all that you've done and of course you know planning to do to have further reach to other parts of africa Thank you for all that you're doing. And you notice that you donate free pads, like you said, and medical equipment. How can people support you and your foundation? So, so they can, we've got a website, which is 
www.specialladyawareness.com. Um, there was a link to our GoFundMe page. There was also our bank account details, okay. um, which is the NGO account. They can always get in touch on our Instagram, which is at Special Lady Awareness, and all one word, so at Special Lady Awareness, all one word. On Facebook, it's Special Lady, one word, then Space Awareness, or so Special Lady Awareness. On our YouTube, they can also see some of the videos of some of our work, which is Special Lady Awareness. So all these platforms, people can get in touch. And um, as I said, the bank details and the GoFundMe link is on our website. So Wonderful. Thank you. I'll put all the links in the show notes as well so people can reach out to you and support you and be part of this change and movement across the globe. Thank you so Thank much. You. So with all, yeah, with all your journey, all that you've been through, how do you think that has changed you as a person? For me, it has given me a sense of fulfillment. I feel more fulfilled, you know, than before. I feel like I have a purpose now. Mm. I feel like I'm not just living. You know, I don't. I'm not just living. As I just don't get up and feel like, oh, okay, it's tonight. <laughs> no, the next day. <laughs> I feel like um, I was brought on this earth for a reason. I was given this condition for a reason and I was chosen to be the voice for many. Although in order to get to where I am, I had to go through a lot. I had to fail it physically, mentally, emotionally. It hasn't been easy. You know, trust me, there are some times you cry, you, you question yourself, especially when you're in pain and you question why, why are you going through these? When you get diagnosis, like when I got my diabetes diagnosis recently, I was like, what again? What's going on? And I have to start my medication straight away. But then again, I still feel like there is a reason for this. There was a purpose. There was another purpose. Maybe not just being a reproductive health advocate. Maybe, who knows? Also channel your education in diabetes as well because it affects a lot of black people as well and Asians, you know. So maybe something that you need to talk about. Mm -hmm. And also not only just black or Asians, also some some white people do have it. It's a condition that if you don't take early uh, steps or management, it can affect you, you can lose your sight. Some, they have to get their legs amputated and all that. So it's also another thing, maybe God wants you to you know, um, have a bit of an education and a bit of an experience. I'm still new to it. I'm still learning, you know, about diabetes yeah. and all that. But uh, to me, I'm, I, feel, I still feel the same. I still, you know, try and incorporate a lot of exercise and eat well. But for me, everything or every steps that I've taken, I've been through, I do not regret. Mm. It came for a purpose. And as you know, the saying goes, I think it was Oprah that said, turn your wounds into wisdom. Use your pain, your trauma, your challenges, you know, to impact the world, to educate others, to inspire others. And that's what I'm doing, just turning every wound I've been through, I've had, or I've experienced every trauma, every pain, so that one day when I get called, someone would just look back and say hey she gave us the platform she gave us the voice she gave us the faith she made us realize that our condition do not define us we should keep yes. striving so that's what i can say well done dr amoa that was amazing thank you so much for all that you've shared today with us thank you for being so vocal for choosing to share your story and your condition knowing you fully well as you said you received some backlash and that there will be some people that would not be happy with you coming out to speak but in spite of all that in spite of the stigma in spite of it being taboo to speak about things like this you forged their head and wrote your book and still writing another book 
and start at your foundation to raise more awareness, to support more people. You're such a blessing. Thank you for all that you're doing. Thank you for all that you've been doing and what you're yet to do. Thank you for teaching young girls and many of us across the globe the importance of advocating for yourself. That is so important because many times people back down because again, a doctor or someone might tell you, well, it's in your head, it's not reality. Mm -hmm. But you're teaching young girls today that if you're feeling something, keep pushing, keep checking, get a second opinion, get a third opinion, keep seeking until you feel heard and you feel seen mm -hmm. and someone goes ahead and helps you to investigate further. Definitely. Thank you for teaching us that and Thank teaching you. people across the globe. Uh, you're such an inspiration. Thank you for you know making the time to come out here today to have this conversation with us. I know that you're pretty busy. Um, so for making the time to come on today, thank you for all that you're doing and, um, we'll definitely be supporting your foundation and putting all the details in the show notes so that people can reach out to you and support and help you reach more people across the globe. And we thank look you. forward to having you again in the near future. <laughs> definitely. Definitely. I'm, so, I'm so like, um, touched. Thank you for the kind words, you know? It feels so good and amazing to realize that, you know, people genuinely appreciate, you know, the little thing I'm doing, the little change <laughs> that I feel like I'm doing. So thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much for this platform. And I know a lot of people will learn from it. And as you said, they shouldn't keep quiet. They should speak, 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 speak till you get the right answers, till you feel fulfilled, till you feel like, hey, now I have answers and I'm not yes. making it up. Exactly. Well said. Thank you so much, Dr. Elizabeth Amoa. Thank you. And we look forward to having you again in the near Thank future. You, Thank you very much, Allah. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs>